I suppose the aim of our talk is to uh, give you an overview um, of the existing regulatory structure um, supported by you know, licenses that, from my point of view, my part, my part of the presentation, that and the extent to which that uh, allows or permits um, exceptions to copyright law within the educational context. And my colleague Darius Whelan will follow up with his presentation and he can tell you the content of that in due course. I guess just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, this is being recorded for, and I think Patrick intends to put it online, so just to be aware of that. Um, myself and Darius have also discussed the whole Q&A approach and given that we're giving two related but uh, separate presentations um, and so some of the questions that might arise from my presentation will in fact be addressed by Darius directly. Um, we feel it probably will work best for the Q&As to happen at the end of the two sessions. Additionally, given that it's being recorded, um, it probably wouldn't lend itself to, um, to the Q&As arising in the course of the presentation. So I hope that's okay with everybody. So scribble away if you have queries and we can deal with them uh, individually or collectively at the end and we're very happy to do so. Um, so the, my part of the presentation is going to look specifically at copyright law, what it is, what it protects, how it protects it, and then looking at exceptions to copyright protection you know, somewhat generally, very briefly, but more specifically at um, exceptions within the educational context given our environs. And then I'll touch on um, a couple of other um, maybe related issues. So by way of overview, what I hope to address in the next 20-25 um, minutes is, you know, are the following issues on the, on the opening slide. You know, what is copyright? What rights arise by virtue of having the status of the copyright owner of a, an original work? You know, what are you permitted to do and what can you prevent others from doing? Um, looking then at the, the regulatory framework that's in place, which is in essence the Copyright and Related Rights Act of 2000, we will look at the statutory exceptions to what is otherwise quite a strong blanket um, protection afforded to the copyright owner. So when can uh, those very strong protections be uh, um, avoided or sidestepped and what kind of a user do you need to be? So we look <coughs> briefly at the general fair dealing exception, which applies to a broader group than just the educational context, but obviously, um, given its extreme relevance in this context, we will look directly at the statutory wording relating to the five sections that govern the educational exception. Um, you will learn, and I hope in the course of the next few minutes, that the educational exception as set out by statute is actually quite limited, um, but that thankfully we have much broader powers now, given that we have signed, and we, we are now obliged to be a party to, the Irish Copyright Licensing Agency, um, license, which um, relates to in this to all, I mean other other education establishments too, but certainly all third level institutions in Ireland are now a party to the ICLA license, and I will just give you um, an idea, I hope in, in some detail, as to what that now allows us to do as as staff of the university, but also what it permits our students to do, and how it has extended our capacity to deal with what would otherwise be protected works. And then briefly, just by way of completion, I'll mention the issues of moral rights, to ensure you have an understanding of what they are and what they mean, which are coexist with the economic copyright, more traditional economic based right. And I'll touch briefly on the rights of employers in respect of the copyright of a work that you might create, specifically UCC. And I'll just touch very briefly on the UCC intellectual property rights policy for your information more than anything else. And then just very simply at the end, quick slide on the remedies if your copyright is breached. Okay, so I hope that will give you the full picture of, of copyright law in Ireland uh, and obviously more specifically in the educational context. <clears throat> so by way of opener, I suppose, what is copyright? Well, interestingly, in the 2000 Act, that is just to repeat, the Copyright and Related Rights Act of 2000, for the first time, statute recognised that copyright is in fact a property right. And I suppose by way of information, that's particularly interesting in Ireland because property is the, the right to own property is a constitutional right, so you know whether they meant to or not, it certainly was an elevation of the concept of copyright as regards the um, the status of the right of an individual who holds the copyright in a property. So it's expressly referred to in Section 17 of the Act as a, a property right. So. When does copyright subsist? Well, copyright subsists once the work you create is original. Now, certainly in my world, the original works that I would create would be you know, the traditional literary work, but obviously copyright extends to all original works, and I will, I'll go 
go through the definitions and the legislation with you in a moment. Interestingly, people can get confused as to, you know, there's this view that you have to post it to yourself to show the date you wrote it and identify when it, when it was written um, in order to prioritise it. But in fact, you know, in law, in, certainly in theory, and the law supports this, so long as the work is original, the copyright status subsists automatically by virtue of the originality. So very simply, unlike, for example, applying for a patent or registering a trademark, with copyright protection, it subsists by virtue of the original status of the work. So the query really goes to whether or not the work is original rather than necessarily when it was written or, or who wrote it uh, as regards its status <coughs> as copyright protected. I'll go through this in more detail in a moment, but copyright, I often say to my students, is you know, both a positive and a negative right. What I mean by that is that once you own the copyright in a work, you have the sole right to use that work. Equally, you have the sole right to prevent everybody else from using it. So you have the positive right and also the right to prevent others. Um, and it, as I say, subsists automatically and it exists for your whole life plus another 70 years. So that is why, for example, James Joyce's work has only come into the public domain in the last 12 months because he's now dead 70 years. So, you know, the, the thinking behind that as regards theory is that when you create this original work that you should be able to provide financially for your children and their children in turn. Um, hence the protection for the, the period that goes beyond your death. So you, you survive your death in, in, in terms of your academic brilliance, I suppose. So what work is protected by copyright? So again, this is the legislation in Ireland as supplemented by Amendment Acts in 04 and 07, just for your information. Um, and there's a definition in Section 17 uh, as to what it covers. Now, um, up until the 2000 Act, uh, no piece of legislation, for example, referred to a computer program as being covered by uh, copyright protection. Literary work is now further defined, for example, within the Act as including a computer program. So, you know, I won't do it today, but you can break down many of those terms and look to the legislation as to what they encompass. Also, even though computer program, for example, wasn't included in the preceding Act, the courts had developed a willingness to recognise that it would be a literary work. So, you know, given that legislation by definition is applied in the court context, interpretation will always move with the times. So, um, we had seen that bit of flexibility prior to the enactment of the 2000 Act in terms of the scope of what uh, constitutes a literary work or what is covered by copyright generally. I, ho I hope that makes sense. So, you just see that, as for your information, what might be regarded as, um, as the work that would be. Would, would automatically uh, attract copyright protection. Okay, so I did mention to you that the copyright subsists automatically once it's an original work. So just very briefly, by way for, for way of completion, you know what's original? Well, an original expression obviously turn whether or not it's original turns on the facts of a given case. So you can't say well it has to comply with the following formula to be deemed original. There's a most of the case law that I would rely upon in class would be uh, based in the UK, and it's quite. Um, established at this point that the threshold for originality is very low. It also doesn't have to be brilliant, so it can be very original, very useless, or very badly written, but it can still be original. So it's not about quality, it's about originality. And the other key point is that, and this is expressly provided for as well in Section 17 of our Act, is that it doesn't, copyright doesn't attach to the idea, it attaches to the expression of the idea. So I might write an article with some very ingenious thoughts about some area of law. Darius might write an article with quite similar ideas, but it's because the, the way I express it is original. That's where the copyright subsists in the, in the literary work itself, if, if that makes sense. Because you can't own an idea. You know, that, that would obviously be very contrary to, to social policy and so um, the public policy. So it's the way you express it. And if you express it differently, this is a bit glib, but the example I use for my students in classes, you know, the, 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 the Hollywood movie where boy meets girl, they fall in love, and then they have a big fight, and then they make up at the end. You know, Meg Ryan is usually in there somewhere. You know, there's a million of those movies. The idea is not owned by anyone, but it's the way they express the idea in every other version of that same movie. So similarly, if you create an, um, a, a, an original literary work, if you, your expression of those words or those, sorry, of that idea is, is unique. Well, that's where the originality lies, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent is a whole other issue for yourself, I guess. So the rights that you have as a copyright owner, very briefly, I won't dwell on it to you, the right to, to distribute, the right to copy, the right to adapt, um, the right to communicate it, to make it available. So they're your exclusive rights as the copyright owner, and then you prevent everybody else from doing that, uh, obviously, unless you give them permission. So others then are prohibited from doing all those things without your permission, and, and that's very important. You can give them permission to do so, and that's where the licenses come in. Um, so uh, this is now probably, I suppose, the, the nub of, of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so notwithstanding this huge, almost monopoly type right that attaches to someone who has copyright protection, in respect of an original work, there are um, exceptions to the, to the, the breadth of, of the protection. So for example, the 2000 Act sets out um, 
quite, quite clearly that there are exceptions to the protection and they are under the following headings. So fair dealing, education, private research, criticism or review or incidental inclusion. So the statute dictates that these are exceptions to copyright protection. And additionally, you can have exceptions where they're done by agreement through a license. So like a contract, but it's different in, in terms of law. Um, and it's a license whereby the copyright owner would license the use of the work subject to certain terms and conditions. Okay? So I'm going to look at the ones that are relevant. So for example, fair dealing. Fair dealing is like the umbrella um, exception whereby um, we have specific areas where it can be used, private research or study. So you know, obviously that can be relevant to this context. Criticism or review or incidental inclusion. And what do we mean by fair dealing? Well, it's a lovely, one of those lovely sort of broad terms that is subject to judicial interpretation and application, but the legislation has tried to tie it down a little bit and has said that fair dealing means the use of the work in circumstances where it has already been lawfully made available to the public for a purpose and to an extent which will not unreasonably prejudice the interest of the owner of the copyright. So that's quite broad um, and really would, you know, any case would turn on the facts. In our context, we have a specific education exception. So I think that as regards you know, my use of copyright protected works as a lecturer, um, that comes quite squarely within the education exception. This is more broad. Um, you know, for example, you can use work that is copyright protected if you're criticizing work. So if you're doing a book review, for example, you can use quotes from the book. Um, because you're, you're, you're using what would otherwise be protected material without the permission of the copyright owner, but you're doing so for the purpose of criticism or review. Similarly, um, yeah, and so that, that would be the obvious one, I think, or in private research or study. So just like you would, um, you know, if one of your students was writing an essay, you know, they would put in quotes, um, and so long as they're given the proper citation and reference, and it doesn't unreasonably prejudice the interests of the owner as regards their copyright, well, that's regarded as fair dealing. Um, Darius is going to talk to you a little bit more about this in light of recent reform suggestions. Um, but, um, and so I won't dwell too much on it. In the US, there's a similar but broader concept of fair use that you may have heard of. In Ireland, we say fair dealing. Um, moving on to the education exception, which um, perhaps is more, you know, in some instances, more obviously applied to, if I can talk about us as a collective group, to our, our setup. It's governed by sections 53 to 58 of the 2000 Act, and in essence permits um, use of copyright protected works within the educational context. Um, so for example, it permits copying for instruction or preparation for instruction. So um, if I'm giving a class and I want to put an image or a quote from copyright protected work uh, on my PowerPoint presentation or on the board, I can do so for the purposes of instruction. Um, now, it does rely upon sort of more archaic principles such as, you know, you can copy it, but you can't use a photocopier. That's what reprographic means means. Um, uh, you know, and it, it certainly was written, you know, as I say, in, in different times. Um, it doesn't, you know, kind of embrace the notions of PowerPoint or scanning, etc., etc. Um, and we will deal with that in the, in the license section of the presentation. But, I mean, in essence, what it permits us to do as instructors, certainly, is to utilize copyright protected works for the purposes of instruction. But we should only make one copy. We should acknowledge where it came from. Um, we can make the copy or someone can make it on our behalf, but it can't be a photocopy. Um, what, what is copying? Well, we discussed this this morning, myself and Darius, you know, the word copying is used, but it was used back in the 1990s when they were drafting the legislation based on even older EU uh, provisions. And so we kind of were of the view that whilst you can't be quite definitive about this, that you know, a, a court in 2012 would probably regard copying as incorporating things like putting it on a PowerPoint screen, you know, that type of copying um, in the modern context. So I don't think that there would be a very strict you know, interpretation of it as regards the notion of copying, particularly where copying doesn't include photocopying. You know, I think that there would, I would expect an understanding of the, the broader context and, and what is utilised in teaching in 2012. Um, <clears throat> what else am I saying? Um, okay, yeah, so you can make copies for the purpose of setting an examination, so maybe you're a lecturer in English and you want to put on a poem or an extract from a book on the exam paper for the students to comment on. You know, that's per perfectly fine when it's the, for the purpose of an examination. You know, just a couple of other brief points. It's not just copying, you know, literary works. It can also include the, the various versions of original works that I have on the screen. Um, you can't obviously sell it on or use your PowerPoint presentation and uh, for the purposes of sale or whatever materials that you produce as a result of this exception. Um, uh, but I think that 
it is quite a conservative approach to the education exception. It's quite limited. Um, it's also quite dated nowadays. Um, and as a result, I think that the license that we are a party to with the Irish Copyright Licensing Agency becomes even more important. And I think that really is the basis upon which I would um, um, rely upon the education exception based on the terms of the license. I would very rarely you know, look to the sections 53 to 58 of the Act. Um, rather, I think that we are now, in essence, governed by the ICLA license. So I suppose just by way of overview before I refer to the slide, um, the 2000 Act when enacted um, facilitated, in fact required that in time that there would be an, an agency or a licensing body established in Ireland for the purposes of dealing with the educational exception specifically. And that was set up in uh, a couple of years after the 2000 Act was enacted. And the Irish Copyright Licensing Agency um, is the body now that governs the licensing of uh, the use of copyright protected materials in the education context and it's now mandatory for example for UCC to be a party to this license and we are. So the first I have for you, I must carry this with me, um, if everybody, these are little packages of documents and I think it might be useful for you to have these as I talk to you so sorry now Patrick I'm moving. There's three for you. Okay sorry there's no, there, no there's three so you take that one. That's for you and that's for you. Okay just so I can refer you to the there's three. Great, sorry. I could have given these out earlier, sorry. No. One and two. Great, thanks. So what I've given you there is a copy of the original license that UCC signed back in 05. And this was the Education License Agreement, which set out the the manner in which copyright protected material covered by the agreement could be utilised by staff and students and it is a broader, more generous exception to copyright protection in the original legislation. So, as it says in the slide, it overrides the statutory limitations as I see it in the 2000 Act. Obviously, the extent to it doesn't give a blanket licence of you do anything you want. The use of the material is governed and limited by the terms of the licence. It can be relied on by all staff and students at UCC. Um, when you are relying upon the license and making a copy of the relevant copyright protected material, you must make a copy of the original work. What does it refer to? Well, um, I'll come to that in a minute, I suppose, maybe. Yeah, so, so what it allows you to do is that it allows you to make copies. I think I have this on a slide. Sorry, now I'm... So, yes, this is what I wanted to get to. The extent of the license. So what the license allows us to do is to make or permit others to make copies of what is otherwise copyright protected material as required by the employees and or the students. And I've given you also user guidelines that were reissued and updated in November 2011. And you'll see that that and the licence both expressly allow copy of a copyright protected, otherwise protected material to be made for every student and two for the tutor. So it's actually much broader than anything envisaged by the 2000 Act, which basically allows the instructor to make a copy. Um, and that was more or less the end of it. So, you know, in theory, according to the license, you can make a copy for every student in a large class, and it's within the terms of the license. Um, as I said, the copy must be a copy of the original. Um, it also, the license expressly permits the compilation of course packs, um, and these can be distributed to students, and the students can be charged for those packs so long as it covers the expenses incurred in putting them together. You know, prior to that, the, the collation of copyright protected material without permission would undoubtedly have been a breach. Now, you must include the name of the author and the publisher on the front page of each copy, but I don't think that's asking too much. So it, it does recognise the reality of teaching, um, particularly, I suppose, pre the digital age, where, you know, you would, might be inclined to make copies for your students, if for no other reason to make sure that they might be more inclined to read them. Not that they would read them, but they might be more inclined if they had a copy in their hand. And so that's now facilitated by the license. So I think that whilst you know, the 2000 Act, when it existed by itself before the license, was very hampering um, on the educational context, in the educational context, because it meant that really only the, um, the uh, staff member could make the copy. Um, and uh, it did, I think, uh, fail to recognise the reality of the classroom environment and the need to distribute material. Um, however, I think what's um, Okay, the limitations, I suppose, by way of completion. What could you copy? Well, you can't, I mean, notwithstanding the license, you don't have free reign. You still can only copy, you know, one chapter from a book or one article from a particular journal or, five, you know, 5% of a book is kind of regarded generally as one chapter. <clears throat> you can copy a whole article, as I say, but nothing more than that in one particular journal or publication, 
you know, a short poem, not more than 10 pages in length, if that's your area, um, and obviously cannot be in connection with any commercial activity other than educational purposes. So you can't then go on and sell an anthology or whatever else of, of um, the work. Now, this, I think, is, you know, where it becomes hugely relevant for us in 2012. Up until 2006, as wonderful as the terms of the license were, they were limited because they did not allow for any scanning, etc., etc. And so our hands were very tied, notwithstanding the, the development of, for example, Blackboard, etc. So the second thing I've given you is the supplemental license that was effective from January 2006. So it's not separate to the first license, it's, it's additional and um, is subject to the terms of the first license as well. And what that allows us to do is it permits the scanning of what is otherwise copyright protected material, the posting of that material on an intranet, so in our world that's Blackboard, um, and the subsequent printing of that material that is posted on Blackboard by students. Um, you cannot, as the, let's say, the instructor, email the protected works, you cannot put it on the internet, you can only put it on the intranet. So if a student contacts you and says, I can't get through to Blackboard, I know you scanned an article for us, could you send it on to me by email? No, you can't. You can only use it through that protected world that is Blackboard. Why? Well, because there's a def defined limited audience. So it's still protecting to a certain extent the rights of the copyright owner um, and limiting the, what might be regarded as the prejudice that might attach to them. You cannot reproduce the material on a CD, a DVD, or you know, you can't have a digital version of it. You can, however, have it on your system if that's technically necessary in the scanning process if you follow. Um, but you can't kind of keep all these relevant articles in this area and then suddenly have a little folder and compile them for your own database. That goes too far. It's about distribution and doing so through digital means. But I think this is hugely significant. Um, and it means that if you're putting articles on, on Blackboard, it's not the public domain. It's regarded and recognized as an intranet and therefore um, confined and restricted as regards um, who can access it. Just making sure I went through. Is there anything else I want to mention? Yes, as regards what material is covered, obviously that's hugely important. You know, it's not that well, we signed the ICLA license and therefore we have free reign in relation to everything. Um, I didn't copy this for you, I didn't, didn't really think there was a need to, but I can refer you to um, <coughs> what we've done is that in Ireland, one of the pages you have is the user, no, not the user guidelines, I gave you the other one, the excluded works list. So up until um, a couple of years ago, <coughs> like the EU and the US, what we had was a list of, I think it was 56 publishers in Ireland. And if your publication that you wanted to make a copy of or part of, a co part of it copied <coughs> was published by one of those 56 publishers or some number like that, you were, it came within the terms of the license. Interestingly, in the 2011 update, the excluded works list, you'll see that it's now the opposite approach. It's an inclusive approach. So everybody, all publishers in Ireland are included, except those listed here on the sheet. So to me, it seems like a much broader scope. And what happens then is that the IC, and how does it work? Well, what happens is that for every student in UCC, we pay uh, a fixed sum. It used to be six euro, then it was eight euro. It's something along that, around that amount of money per student. And then per head, per student, am I right or am I wrong? I don't know. Oh. Okay, well the last I heard it was about six or eight euro. That was a few years ago. And so then, so say we have, I don't know how many students we have. How many students do we have? However many students we have. You pay that by the six euro or the eight euro. And then that money goes to the ICLA and it's divvied up then amongst the publishers and it seeps down in theory to the authors, and that's how they get uh, remunerated for their work. So in Ireland, it's quite an, what I would call an inclusive approach to what's covered. Then if you look at, uh, if you, it's on the ICLA website, what they have then for the US is that they list the participating US publishers. So it's, it's, you know, it's international, there's mutual agreements between jurisdictions, and so as regards the US, given that there are so many gazillion publishers in the US, what they've done is they positively state who's included. So, you know, if you want to check, does your work come within the terms of the ICLA license, you go to their website, you look at the US publishers, and you see if your publisher is included. In the UK and the EU, it's those, again, who are excluded. So, again, more inclusive approach, and you can identify who's not on the list. Okay, so they're all kept on the ICLA website for your reference. Um, and that's important because you can't presume that your publisher is included, although it appears that m most Irish publications are, and in fairness, uh, the UK as well. So the last couple of slides, um, moral rights. Yeah, I, I thought it was important to mention this, that traditionally, and certainly in Ireland up until 2000, you had what we call the copyright, which is you know, the economically exploitable right to exclusive use in your protected work. Now, you know, many of us uh, might write articles for journals or for books or whatever, and you 
sign away your copyright. So you sell your copyright and you get your 75 euro for your article in the journal or whatever. You know, the notion is that they pay you something and you sign your copyright and then they can publish your article and very often they own the copyright. Or you can have an instance where you would share the ownership and the copyright. It's subject to the terms of you know, that one page doc that you sign when you, when you have something published. Or if you write a book, you know, it depends on the terms of the agreement with your publishing house. However, whether or not you give up all your copyright ownership or whether you share it or whatever else, you as the author will always retain what we call the moral rights. This is a very um, kind of French concept. It comes from the civil law uh, and uh, began life in the Berne Convention. But anyway, it, the EU pushed it in the late 1990s and eventually <coughs> has now become part of the harmonised copyright law across Europe and uh, exists under our Chapter 7 of our 2000 Act. And what it means in essence is that if you create an original work, whilst you can of course sell it and be remunerated for the copyright and then you no longer own the copyright, it's kind of the idea that it will always be a part of you because it was your creative genius that created this original work and so you must always be rec recognised as the author of the work. So for example if you sell it to, I don't know, Rowan Hall Thompson and you know the grandchild of the owner of Rowan Hall Thompson has always wanted her name in a book so he says here's a million for the book we're putting my granddaughter's name on it. They can't do that because this notion of moral rights means that it always attaches to you. It's kind of like, you know, it's your, like your arm, it's always a part of who you are um, and even though you might choose to sell it, I hope this is making sense, you might choose to sell it uh, you can never give away your ownership in it. So equally, so that's the paternity right. Also, for example, they can't, what we could say, mutilate it, which sounds very dramatic, but you know, say if they thought, God, you know, those last two chapters are pretty useless, so we're just going to delete those. They can't do that even though they own the copyright. Why? Because they're mutilating or distorting your original work. So it's like you kind of always have a hold over your work, and that's the notion of moral rights. Um, now, unfortunately, under Irish law, from my point of view, we allow moral rights to be waived, with, waived with an I, um, which I remember giving a talk at a conference in Europe a couple of years ago and they were convinced that I just didn't get it, that of course you couldn't waive your moral rights, you go back and check your legislation, you know, because the whole notion of moral rights is that it's a part, an essence of who you are and the works you create are part of who you are, so how could you possibly give that up? It goes against the whole concept of moral rights. Um, but we can, because that's what the Irish legislation says across Europe, that would be unheard of. And, and what happens in some contracts is that, you know, if you want us to pay you for your copyright, you must waive your moral rights and that is something that is seeping into standard contracts and there's a lot of controversy about it. The final thing I want to say about moral rights is that uh, even though, um, and it relates to the UCC IP policy so maybe I should go on to that, um, according to legislation if you create original works in the course of your employment your employer owns it by virtue of section 23 of the act. Okay, so where work is made by an employee in the course of employment the employer is the first owner of copyright in that work subject to contract agreement between the parties. So uh, if you write a book whilst you're in UCC or you write an article UCC owns the copyright in it as your employer. Um, now there is the whole side argument of well I do it also at the weekends when I'm at home in my study. And th that's just a matter of you know circumstances and you know you have to make an adjudication on the on the facts for a particular case but obviously what's very important is you know negotiating an alternative arrangement with your employer. <coughs> However in UCC and you will find this on website, the HR website, I think I found it on today, and it was still the same as it was the last time I checked. The IP policy in UCC, certainly in relation to copyright, is that whilst they recognise in the first paragraph that they are the owner of all IP works created by staff by virtue of the legislation, they do not assert ownership in um, copyright in relation to educational, pedagogical, literary works. So whilst they are the owners in law, they do not assert it. And that's all very lovely and nice, recognising that we are the creators of our own work. The difficulty that I see it, and this is that if there's someone breached your copyright, I think UCC would have to come on board. It's our Office of Corporate Affairs. But as I see it, UCC would have to come on board as party to the proceedings because the first defence that your, the alleged infringer would say is that, well, you don't own the copyright. How can you possibly claim we've breached it. So there is that issue. And then in relation to that, if there is an issue as to your moral rights, whilst UCC owned the copyright, I think there might be some issue as to who really owns the moral rights. So that's just getting a bit technical, but just I suppose as people who might be creating works in the course of your employment to be aware of those issues. But certainly in relation to copyright, UCC respects the fact, I think, that uh, they won't, they, they state they don't assert their right. They don't give it up, but they won't assert it. Okay, um, does that cover? Yes. So Oh, there you go, there was a slide and everything for it. Um, so they have a statutory entitlement, they don't assert it, um, and they, there's no mention certainly that I've ever seen in any contract of employment in UCC in relation to anything extra um, or avoiding the statutory position. Um, obviously, patents is a whole other ball game, not for today. The IP policy in UCC has a whole technical 
formula for you know who owns what percentage of a patent and the commercialization of students work and lecturers work etc so that's not for today just but just be aware that it's very detailed and something that UCC has worked on as regards their IP policy more generally final slide remedies for breach if your copyright is breached for what it's worth there are criminal and civil remedies available and um, there's also EU provision where in 2005 the enforcement directive was um, enacted and that has given rise to a much greater degree of harmony across Europe so it's okay if you're breached outside of Ireland within the EU the provisions the protections the measures the evidence issues should all be pretty similar um, and in civil proceedings the type of remedies you can secure are damages an injunction cease and desist means they must stop what they're doing and um, if they make money out of your, the breach in your copyright you can get account for their profits and gain okay so that is the end of my presentation I hope it was relevant to any issues that you might face or the, any questions that you might have had. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, Darius and I will take questions at the end. Okay, thank you.